talk a little bit about this idea of the last days. Oh, by the way, let's just get this out of this. Let's get this out of our system right now. Hey, Lauren, can you stand up and show everybody what a nice haircut looks like? <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Good job, guys. Yay. That's beautiful. <laughs> now, this is a bad haircut. <laughs> this is really bad. Okay? This is, I'll, I'll tell the story on this. That way we can just get it all out of our systems. And then we can move on with the teaching. This morning, I had a little bit of time. And so I trimmed my hair up really nice. I mean, I was looking dashing, okay? And then I ran downstairs and had myself a little breakfast. And then I ran back upstairs, started the shower water. And then I looked in, this, and I looked in the mirror and I saw a little spot that needed a little more trimming. And so I just grabbed my buzzers and just went <laughs> And the guard was not on the, uh -huh. the, you know the guard, you know what I'm talking about. And then it does not make it look like this. So I had to do the rest of my own. So my wife wants me to do at least this a little shorter. Right now I'm just, I'm, a, I'm mourning the loss of what I once had. I can suggest so, that. So, uh, if you just want to laugh and get it, let's just I do that. At least yours grows back. For you. I, don't, I don't have that option. Oh. It grows back just in patches. Yeah. yeah. In places. Wow. Okay. So. Everybody done laughing? You want to get, Joan's still laughing. Okay, hold on. <laughs> I, was just I thought I'd have support from you. You're laughing instead. Just Your mommy loves you. Just the advice you. Thanks that I'm having a little bit of a problem. I slipped off while I was doing the dog. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Now this one was, oh, I'll just get this a little bit. <laughs> oh. Well, I paid to have mine done. Oh, that's mine. Yeah? Yeah, that's yeah I lost awesome. about that much across the back. It's like I couldn't. <laughs> Just strain her or something or another. <laughs> Happy birthday to you too. All right. So, Matthew 24. <clears throat> We're going to start in verse 1. And tonight I'm going to try to get done in a decent amount of time, but I have kind of like two particular directions I want to go. And uh, I'm going to do the first part, which is up on the board here, um, and then go to the second part. So, Matthew 24, Jesus comes out of the temple and is going away when his disciples come up to point out the temple buildings to him. I guess they like the way they looked or something. He said to them, do, not, <clears throat> do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. He was sitting on the Mount of Olives. So the Mount of Olives, just from a geographic standpoint, is a large mount that sits opposite the temple. That when you're up on the Mount of Olives, it looks over the tabernacle, the temple mount. Okay? He's sitting on the Mount of Olives, and the disciples come to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Okay? If you actually look at verse 3, it's three questions. It's not one question. It's three. First question, tell us when these things will happen. Second question, what will be the sign of your coming? Third question, tell us of the end of the age. Okay? Those are not, that's not one question asked three different ways. That's three separate questions. And we're going to see in Matthew 24 how he answers each one of those questions separately. Okay? So, just so you know, that's what we're going to be doing the majority of tonight. I want to show you a little bit of this here just to give you an idea of the thought process as a whole of the term, the last days. And it's not going to all happen tonight. I want to give you an overview of what I believe Scripture talks about when it talks about the last days. By the way, the term last days or the term end of the age that is here has everything to do with the end of or the consummation, actually it's a better word. The word actually means in the Greek, consummation. In other words, it's a finishing, it's a summing up. It's a bringing all things to a mighty conclusion. Okay? But it also means that the word age there in uh, verse 3, at the end of the age, can be interpreted as one of two words in the Greek. Okay? Or translated as one of two words from the Greek. And that is either... Um, let me get this right. Oh, the world. Okay? It can be, it's another word for the world, which means the end of the world, this system, 
this orderly arrangement of things the cosmos is, but it can also mean a period of time. Okay? Now, in this particular case here, the translation is a little more toward the world than it is a particular period of time. Okay? But in many cases, here, you're going to, I, I'm looking at this as far as the term dispensation. Has everybody ever heard that word before? Anyone want to tell me what you think it means? You heard the word before, Robert. Yeah, period of time for period. God's going one specific thing. Correct. Relation to man. Absolutely. Okay? So if you look at Scripture, you can almost break it up, not just Old Testament, New Testament, but you can also break it up into dispensations of God working one way at one particular time, and then not necessarily changing who He is, but changing the way He is with another group of people or at another time. Okay? Those are dispensations. So... Uh, Probably one of the most classic dispensations is the idea, look who's here. How are you? Welcome. So one particular dispensation that Paul talks a lot about is an age for the Jews and then an age for the, the Gentile. Okay? At a period of time, God was only dealing with the Jews, even to the point where you see Jesus saying, look, remember the lady that comes to him? And he says, look, I did not come for you. She was a Samaritan. He says, I, I came for the lost children of Israel, or the lost sheep of Israel. And what, remember what her response was? Yeah, even dogs eat crumbs from the master's table. Okay? And he says, I have not found great faith like this in many places. So the idea here is that the dispensation, Jesus is even working within the dispensation, but he also speaks of another dispensation that's coming where the whole earth will know it, not just Jews. Okay? So here what I have in front of you are dispensations. Okay? These are three major dispensations you can find scripturally. Not just Old Testament, New Testament, but dispensations in general. The first one here, and just for a lack of better terms, I'm going to call them days. Okay? First day, second day, third day. Is that okay? I don't know if it's really scriptural as much as it is. It just helps me understand it in terms of the last days, because that's kind of the overarching thing I want to express to you. Okay. So the first day, this is the first dispensation we see in Scripture, okay? We almost have to carve out something here because I want to carve out just this little chunk here because Genesis 1 was a little bit different, wasn't it? Okay? Prior to the fall of man, Genesis 1 was much more like this, where God and man were walking together in the cool of the evening, right? Yeah. But once Genesis 2 takes place, Genesis 3, I should say, and the fall takes place, the sin of man takes place, then there's a separation that occurs. But we don't see God completely separating from man. I want you guys to realize this. When Adam and Eve fall, God does not stop working with Adam and Eve. In fact, we find out very soon afterwards that God's talking to Cain, and in his sin, God's talking to Cain. Okay? So there's still relationship. There's still communication. There's still activity between God and man. But it's much more, God is up here. And every once in a while, he reaches down and interacts with man on earth. Okay? This is probably case in point would be Moses. Right? In order for God to interact with a man called Moses, God calls Moses to climb Mount Sinai. And there, man meets God. Now Moses cries out and says, hey, I want to what? I want to see you. I want to see you. And God says, if you see me, you're going to die. Okay? And so, but I'll let you see my barrier. Okay? And so, but he hides him in the cleft of a rock. And he lets, his see, lets him see his glory as it passes by. And it's such an incredible sighting for Moses that when he comes down the mountain, what's he looking like? His glory is bright shining that people can't even look at him. Okay? That's the kind of relationship man has with God. And only one man could have it. In fact, when Moses comes back down the mountain, or oh, sorry, before Moses goes up the mountain, he is very stern with the people. He says, do not let them even come near the mountain. Okay? So there's this idea that God exists. He does communicate, but rarely 
And if he does, it's almost as if God is up here and man is down here. Other than Genesis 1 where we see man walking in the cool of the day with the Father. Okay, so I'm going to call this the first day. When do you see this shift from this relationship to this relationship? When does this dispensation end and this dispensation begin? Scripturally. Jesus, sure. Okay, so th this is where you can almost say the Old Testament. I think I have it. Can I have it written here? It's not a right one. Okay, new. But this would be the New Testament. I'll also put that here too, just for an understanding. Okay, so this dispensation shifts when Jesus shows up in the form of a baby. Now, I will tell you that most Jews, you know this, most Jews, when the Jesus baby shows up, that ain't him. This isn't him, but a few were expecting him. But this is the dispensation that took place. God shifted from being up on a mountain, up in the heavens, with man down on earth, and God every once in a while visiting him and then moving back up. That's the kind of relationship they had here. Then he moves to having this kind of relationship, and we see Jesus walking around in the flesh on the earth. This is a miracle in itself. I mean... This guy, Moses over here, had a burning bush experience with, the, with God. He goes up on a mountain and gets to see his backside. But here we see the living, breathing God walking with man. Miraculous. Completely miraculous. And this is, when you look at it biblically, this is what you would consider the Bible talking about last days or... Uh, well, not really the end of the age. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But it's a period of time that Jesus is initiating something here so that this can end. Okay? So let's talk about what this looks like. Because really, Jesus is walking still in the midst of the people who consider God this way. Okay? The majority of the Jews have a relationship with God like this while Jesus is walking on the planet with man. Am I right? Yeah. We know this because when he starts to call himself one with his father, when he says, you are of your father and I am of my father, they're all like, I don't know who you are. We're, we're sons of Abraham. And, and God's up here and we're down here. He, his message, his presence, his identity is rejected because this is the dispensation that they believe. Right? Okay. So, this... For 2,000 years, or sorry, Jesus does this, walks like this. There's a period of time that comes up to here. And 2,000 years ago, this is how Jesus is walking with us. He's not walking very long with us, only three years in this way, though he was with us 33. Okay? So, this dispensation takes place, but it doesn't last super long. There's another dispensation. Dispensation means an age, right? We're back there again. So we, we shift very long. When does this take place? So now we have God a lot closer to man walking alongside of him. But then we have this dispensation. I don't know if you can see it very clearly. But there is a man inside of God. That's my wonderfully autis art autistic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks like so. <laughs> okay. But God in man. That's why we have all these scriptures hanging up here for in him. You have been made complete. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Before all things and in Him all things hold together. The idea was is that all along, even back here in Genesis 1, because we know that this all was planned before the foundations of the world. Right? So Scripture says that Jesus Christ was crucified and the Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world toward this. This third dispensation, this third day. I like to call it the new day. I believe we are living in the new day. Not the old day, not a last day, but a new day. This is the day that uh, even way back when Abraham, it says in Hebrews 11, all the heroes of faith, it says they look forward to the day we're living in. Not this one. This, this sounded good to them, but this is what they were really looking toward. A day where man was in God, God was in man. Hello? Yeah, let's just look at a couple scriptures here just to kind of give you some, some credence for this. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. We're going to be in Matthew 24.
And it shall be in these last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will pour out or forth on my spirit. I will in those days pour forth of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky, blah, 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 all this stuff. So we see that in this day, this transfer, this movement from this dispensation to this, the Holy Spirit doesn't become someone that just visits like he did on Saul over here. Remember how the Holy Spirit showed up with Saul he, when he comes among the prophets? And he prophesies for a little while, and then what happens when he leaves the prophets? He stops prophesying. The Holy Spirit visits comes off. Visits, comes off. Does it all the time. Here, Jesus walks with his kids, walks with them, but then there's this season of time that was, this is, comes from the book of Joel, by the way. He's quoting Joel here in Acts 2. That's Peter preaching. And Acts 2 suddenly gets fulfilled where it's no longer the Holy Spirit just jumps on somebody and jumps off. Now he says, no, I'm going to give it freely and I'm going to put it on you and I'm going to put it in you. Okay? And now God and man are becoming one. What did, John, what did Jesus pray in John 17? I pray that they, they would be one just like you and I are one. And then I be in them, they in me, you and me. All of that oneness stuff. We see it all the time. That's why he talks about in Ephesians 5 how the two shall become one flesh. I'm not talking about a husband and wife. I am talking about Jesus and his bride. Oneness, the two becoming one. Right there. Okay, so in light of this prophetic teaching, in light of this end times teaching, in light of all of these things that you probably have all heard, the uh, left behinds and the rapture teachings and all of that, okay? Matthew 24, Matthew 23, Matthew 25 is talking some about the past some about the present, and some about the future. Okay? What most people see in Matthew 24, those of you that have read Matthew 24, we'll go through it tonight, but most of you have, when you've read Matthew 24, you have heard everyone speaking about it from a purely future perspective. All of these things are going to happen at some point in time. Okay? It's not at all the case here. And Jesus very clearly lays out why it's not the case. Okay? So I need you guys to see this because these are the major scriptural dispensations. We can go through minor ones within it, okay? But these are the three major dispensations. And pretty much from, not, I would say, Acts 2 on. If you want to kind of draw a line in the sand for yourself here. Okay, so we got Matthew 1, right? Or any of the four Gospels 1. <laughs> that dispensation switches. And then here, somewhere around Acts 2. Why Acts 2? What happened in Acts 2? Pentecost. What happened right before Pentecost? Jesus ascends. He says, but don't worry. Huh? My daddy cannot leave you alone. He's going to send you a helper. That's what John 14, 15, 16 talks about. And then when it comes, it doesn't just come, oh, hey, what would you like to do today? Oh, no. <laughs> Holy Spirit comes like fire. And he baptizes his kids. So somewhere in that Acts 2 area, we have a dispensation that takes place where it's no longer, I'm just walking next to you. Oh, no. I'm going to be in you. You're going to be in me. It's powerful. All right. Matthew 24. Let's, let's go dig into this. Any questions so far? We okay? All right. So he asks, or the disciples ask these questions. Tell us when these things will happen. So that is question number one. There's three questions he asks in verse three, or they ask in verse 20, chapter 24. When will these things happen? So what are these things that they're speaking of? Okay. One of them is the temple. But if you go a little bit farther back into Matthew 23, let's just go back there a little bit. Let's see, uh, let's go to 29. 29 is the end of the woes. There are a bunch of woes to the Pharisees. You brood of vipers, you whitewashed tombs, 
You really didn't want to be a scribe or a Pharisee <laughs> in this time. Okay, it's really bad. Verse 29, what do you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites? You build tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partners with them in shedding the blood of prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How will you escape the sentence of hell? Therefore, behold, look at this, I am, present tense. This is not a future thing. He is, in this moment, sending forth, okay? So can everyone just agree with me? It's present. Yeah. All right. I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Not sometime in the future. Not I will. I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Can you name one? Stephen. Stephen. Can you name another? Peter. Yeah. And some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah. You know why that's so important? If you go to the Jewish Bible, what's the first book of the Bible? I know. It's the book of Abel. Last book. Zechariah. Okay. The son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly I say to you, read this with me, all these things will come upon what? This generation. This generation, this generation roughly, just so you guys have an understanding, a biblical generation is 40 years. Just so you understand that. For Jews, a biblical generation is 40 years. The, the, the pattern for that comes from when the... Uh, children of Israel were in the desert, wandering in the wilderness, and it says that they wandered for how many years? Forty. And it was because this generation had to do what? Die. 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 Pass away in order for a new generation to come in. Wow. Forty years. Okay? Roughly in what year are we talking here? What's Matthew 23? What year roughly is this? Anybody have an idea? 33. 33, yeah. Roughly somewhere between 30 and 33, there's... We'll give it, we'll say 33, okay? So roughly 30 to 33 AD, these are being spoken. Just need you guys to realize this. So all these things will happen by when, if we do our math correctly? 73. Roughly 70 to 73 AD. A generation will pass, okay? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you were unwilling. Behold, your house, everybody say, is being. Is. Yeah, is. present tense. This is happening as he's speaking. It's going to happen when? In this generation. He repeats that phrase again in Matthew 24. In this generation, I will leave this house desolate to you. For I say to you, from now on, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When did that happen? Sorry? Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. Well, that's what we call it. Yeah. We call it Palm Sunday here in Western Church, but it was when he entered Jerusalem on the donkey, on the donkey right? Yeah. Okay, so to answer this first question, when will these things happen? That's what they're asking. When will this house be left desolate? When will all of these prophets and wise men be sent to Jerusalem and then we'll, we'll because they understand it, will be the ones killed and crucified? They know what's going on. They want to know when. <laughs> they want to know how much time they have. These guys have a clear understanding. They are sitting on the Mount of Olives. They are looking at the temple that he just said in three days. I will tear this building completely. What's it say? Let's be specific. Not one stone will be left upon another which will not be torn down. They're sitting on the, on the Mount of Olives looking at the temple. And they're asking, all right, you're blowing us away here. You're talking about all this stuff that's going to happen, and it's going to happen in our generation. This generation's not going to pass away, and we're going to see all these things. When? That's what he's about to answer. So, uh, I want to give you guys, if you guys are taking notes, if anyone's taking notes here, the first question is, when will these things happen? From verse 4 to verse 28, Jesus answers this first question. 
The second question is, what will be the sign of your coming? He answers that question in the next six verses, 29 through 35. I'm giving these to you now so we can kind of fly. The third question that the disciples ask him is, tell us about the end of the age. When's this going to happen? When's this going to take place? That one starts in verse 36 of 24, and he moves on, and he keeps going into chapter 25, verse 46. You guys got it? No? All right. When will these things happen? Matthew 24, 4 through 28. What will be the sign of your coming? Matthew 24, 29 through 35. What about the end of the age, guys? What's going on? 24, 36 through 25, 46. We're not going to get through all of that tonight. I'll show you a couple pieces. Let me give you the end from the beginning. I want you to quit being afraid of an end. This thing is going to be glorious. This is not going to end the way you've probably heard about it ending. Okay? It's going to be a glorious finish. It's going to be the church rising in power and glory and majesty and beauty and so much strength and so much authority that it's going to overcome even, what does the Bible say is the last enemy to be defeated? Death. 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 That's how glorious this church is going to be. Jesus is not spending all this time making a bride beautiful and washing her just so he can be defeated or she can be defeated in a tribulation. That's right. Oh no. In fact, tribulation is part of the washing. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna tell you right now, look at your neighbor, they're probably going through some kind of tribulation. Uh -huh. Right now. <laughs> We're serious about that. You guys need to know this. Alright, so let's go to it. Any questions so far? Jesus said to them, see to it that no one misleads you. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? That's how he starts. I want you guys to be very careful. People are going to screw this up. Yeah. For many will come in my name, saying I am the Christ and will mislead many. I want you guys to know, historically, there were so many people arising in the book of Acts that aren't written about. That were all saying, yeah, I'm him, I'm him. Hundreds, hundreds, just in Greek cities alone. Rising up saying, I'm the Christ, come follow me. I'm the Christ, come follow me. They were happening all the time. There's plenty of historical evidence of that. You'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you are not frightened. For those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. Don't forget, the first question is, when will these things happen? For the nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. Guys, historically, after Jesus ascended on high, all of this was taking place in the earth. Famines, wars, earthquakes, it was all taking place. I wish I could take the time tonight to show you. Trust me, there's enough historical documentation to prove it. But all of these things are merely what? The beginning of the birth pangs. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you. You'll be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and mislead many because lawlessness is increased. If you look at the book of uh, books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he talks about how many antichrists have already arisen. When you think about all the teaching that's out there right now about some antichrist that's going to rise up. I mean, I remember when I was in high school and uh, it was Gorbachev. And he had that big, anybody remember a picture of Gorbachev? Yeah. He had that big tattoo on his forehead. Bird mark on his face. Yeah. Oh, that's the mark. That's Back the mark of the beast. He's the antichrist. And he ends up knocking down the wall with Reagan. Now, he wasn't the antichrist, obviously. And there's just time after time after time. I've heard it said about Obama. I've heard it said about Putin. I've heard it said about all these guys. Okay? And, and there's First John saying that, hey, many antichrists have already come. An antichrist is just someone who rises up from inside the church. That's what church John says. Go look at the Gospels. Sorry. The epistles of John. You will see it said, many have come out from among us and preach another gospel and say that Christ didn't raise from the dead or this is a different way you have to go. Antichrist is just simply talking about Antichrist in general definition was someone who denied 
that Jesus was either the Son of God or he resurrected from the dead. Okay? So an Antichrist was scripturally. Where did I stop? Uh, 13. Yeah. Really? Well, 12 was about lawlessness. Okay. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, remember what Jesus tells us? Those uh, churches in Revelation, he who overcomes, <clears throat> he's faithful to the end. I will give and I will grant all those wonderful things he talks about. He will be saved. Verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony. Oh, this is powerful. Give me a second here. To all the nations and then the end will come. Now that doesn't sound right. There is no way that all the gospel could have been preached to all of the nations in by seven. What did we say, seventy to seventy-three A.D. What did Paul say? I want to get this right here. Colossians 1, 23. If indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which, guess what the next word is, was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, was made a minister. He's writing to the Colossians, and he is saying that this persecution that happened to the church in Jerusalem and in Antioch was so incredible that it forced them to spread out throughout all the civilized world. I want you to read this. This comes from... Uh, Harold Everly's book, Victorious Eschatology. I want you to just hear this. Could Paul have stated it any clearer? The gospel was proclaimed in all creation under heaven. In these passages, there are two different Greek words that have been translated into the word world. Paul used the Greek word cosmos in Romans 1.8 and in Colossians, oh, I did it again, Colossians 1.6. The word cosmos can be also translated as world, earth, but it can also be translated as inhabited earth or civilized earth. Paul used that word in Romans 10.18 when he declared that the word has gone out to the ends of the world. Jesus also used this word in Matthew 24.14. Hence we understand that his original declaration was that the disciples would have time to preach the gospel of the kingdom to the civilized world. However way we look at it, the gospel was preached to the whole world within the generation of the first disciples. That's incredible. The entire civilized globe heard the gospel. Remember when it says about that the, uh, the disciples were turning the world upside down. How quickly the gospel got out there. Okay? All right, verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, I don't have time to go on all that, but I can just tell you that everything about that has to do with the idea of a Roman army coming in and taking over the Temple Mount. Which was spoken through, the, through Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Let the reader understand. I'm going to go back to that in a minute. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever's on the housetop must not go down to get the things that are in the house. Whoever's in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babes in those days. Pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation. When will this tribulation occur? In this generation that he's talking to. Such has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will, unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved for the sake of the elect. Those days will be cut short. And if anyone says to you, Behold, here's the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. So if they say to you, Behold, he's in the wilderness, do not go out there. Behold, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe him. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Remember that phrase. Okay, so right here, a switch takes place. When did I tell you that he stops answering the first question? Verse 27, right? 
Okay, so up until this time, he has been talking about when will these things occur? He's being very specific with them, too. He is telling them about wars and famines and about the gospel being preached in all the earth. And he's being so specific with them. And then he ends it with this verse. For just as the lightning comes from the east to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. What was the second question that the disciples asked him? What will be the sign of your coming? I just answered your first question. Moving on to the next one. Okay, so let's just stick to the first question for a second. When will these things occur? And hold on, I want to just, I want to give you a little bit of a end from the beginning type thing here. Verse 34. I know I'm jumping ahead, but I need you guys to see this. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So the first two questions are, come on, I need you to go with me here so you get this in your spirit. First question is what? When will these things happen? These things that you've just talked about, they will happen when? This generation will not pass away. What's the second question? Of what? Does anybody else think that's crazy? When most of you hear the question, what will be the sign of your coming, what are you thinking? I'm already here. No, think about it, think about it. I'm just scratch the sun with my glasses. Come on, I need you to go with me here. When the disciples ask about Jesus' coming, when is he going to what? Rule his kingdom. Establish his kingdom. But they specifically say, when is the sign of your coming? coming? Right? So when any of us ever talk about Jesus' return, we always call it, when will Jesus come? Hello? So when we say that, we're thinking what? Jesus is going to come out of the clouds, and he's going to come where? Here. Here. When did he say that coming would take place, though? One. All of these things shall not take place until before this generation passes away. His coming is different than what we think his coming is. See, this is, this is so important for you to understand. It's right here. It's right here for us. His coming is different than your coming is thinking is its coming. <laughs> Huh? <laughs> the disciples were asking this specific question when they asked, when will you come? They were speaking of what Rob just said there. When will your kingdom come? When will this thing actually take place? This idea that your kingdom, it's always been promised. Remember back in Daniel, there was this little stone that was going to be carved out of the mountain, and it was going to grow until what? Anybody remember? No one knows? Okay, it's okay. That will be bigger than all of the other mountains, and it will overtake the earth. That little stone is the kingdom of God, and it will be carved out of the earth, and it will grow and develop until it overtakes all the rest of the earth. The disciples knew this. They were good Jews. They were looking forward to a day where a king would come, and he would finally take the kingdom by its hands, and he will rule the rest of the earth with it. And so when Jesus shows up, and he says, I am he, these guys start thinking, yeah, it's going to happen. We're finally going to be the head and not the tail. As was promised to the Jews. And then he dies on a cross. And they're thinking to themselves, this, this doesn't look like a kingdom coming. So they're asking him before all of this, when he's talking about all these terrible things that are going to happen, they're asking this question, um, when are you coming? I mean, like the real you, the king you, the conquering you, the one that's going to cause all of this to take place, and all the other kingdoms are going to have to bow low to you. When's that going to happen? Because we've got our swords, and we're ready to go. That's why they even took their swords into Gethsemane. They were thinking at any moment, he's finally going to rise up. He's finally going to stop letting them have their way with him. And he's going to rise up. And instead, he walks away like this. 
They wanted this kingdom to come. So when they asked this question, when will you come? Or what's the specific question? What's the sign of your coming? Let's read this. Just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures gather. By the way, that's a prophetic picture of the, the uh, flag of the Roman Empire. Go look at the flag of the Roman Empire at that time. You'll see uh, a vulture on the flag. Verse 29. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. You guys realize that that is very um, allegorical language. That's very symbolic language. Okay? That's used several other places in Scripture. And, and any of the times it's used, it never actually happens like this. The stars don't actually grow dark. Or the stars don't actually fall. The sun doesn't really go dark. The moon doesn't really give its light. It's a picture of authority. Throughout Scripture, you guys remember the story of Joseph? And he has the dream. And it says, what's bowing down to him? Sun and moon. Sun and the moon and the stars. Were they really bowing down to him? Did the sun and the moon and the stars bow down to Joseph? No. But what did? His brothers and who else? Keep going. Even Pharaoh gave him his ring and said, Ooh, I'm going to tell you right now, you're in charge. Do whatever you got to do. They all bowed to him. They all, the authority bowed low and said, you need to rule right now, Joseph, because the Lord's upon you and you have the authority to save our nation. That's what's going on here. He's talking about how all of these things will bow. The authorities will come low and then real authority will arise. And the, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of the sky to the other. I mean, all of the pre-trip... Uh, Disciples are going, hallelujah, we're going to get out of here before it gets bad. Because he's going to come with the trumpet and it's going to, and what's, what's going to happen? You've just heard this. He's going to come on the clouds with power and great glory and a great trumpet. And the bands are going to be playing while he's coming. Here's the problem. They didn't figure out the coming part very well. Turn to the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. Bible. That'd be terrible to use that last 10% for the Bible. Daniel 7, verse 13. I kept looking in the... Are you guys with me? Anybody? I kept looking in the night visions. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. That sound familiar? And he came up Everybody say two. two. Two the Ancient of Days. Whoa. He wasn't coming from him. He was coming to him. Don't forget this picture up here. This is a really important picture for you guys to remember, okay? He was coming to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. Verse 14. This is so important. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Now think about this. The disciples say, when are you coming? Stephen is being stoned, and he looks up, and where is Jesus? Standing. Standing at the right hand of God the Father. When Jesus ascends on high in Acts, right? He ascends on high and he goes and he takes his rightful place. That picture is Daniel 7. That picture is Matthew 24, 30, 31, 32. 
or 30, 31. The sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. It's, it's, it's the, the heavens open and Stephen's seeing the Lord high and lifted up. And as the stones are hitting him, it's as like, I don't even care. It's, it doesn't matter that I'm being killed right now. My eyes are lifted up and I see him in all of his glory. All right? The kingdom is given to Jesus on the throne. The coming of the Lord Jesus is to heaven, not to earth. It's to the throne of rulership of this kingdom. This is really important. Okay? When he is referring to his coming, he is referring to a place where he ascends to, not where he descends to. When man... A lot of readers, when they read Matthew 24, and they think about Jesus' coming, they think in terms of him coming to earth to rescue man out of the earth. Okay? That's the exact opposite of what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about a time where his coming comes, where I finally go back, I sit at my rightful place at the right hand of God the Father, just like Daniel 7, 13 says, and then he gives me the kingdom. And from this place, in the throne of the heavenlies, I rule this kingdom through man, who is, where is man seated? With him. With him. In the heavenly places. With Christ Jesus, we rule and reign with him. Hello? Oh, this is really good. I think this is really good. <laughs> Did I get through the end of that? All right, 35. Okay, we got to keep going here. 32. Now learn the parable from the fig tree when its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves. We're back in Matthew 24. You know that summer is near. So you too, when you see all of these things, recognize that he is near, right at the door. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. You guys with me so far? So, very, very specific stuff being said here. These things are going to happen when this takes place. Then I am going to take my rightful place. I'm going to come, and the kingdom is going to rule from the heavenly throne into the earth through you. Different kind of coming. Completely different kind of coming. All right. So, any questions so far on the first two? Hello? You guys all right? You sure? It's a lot. Is it a lot? Yeah. All right. I'm trying, I'm trying to make hard stuff simple, best I can. So, okay. So where it says heaven and earth will pass away. Very good. Is that transition? Okay. It's also a confirmation that I can promise you it's going to happen. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not. There is a time where there will be a new heavens and a new earth, guys. So. Okay, so that's not tied to that generation. Mm -hmm. okay. that's, a, that's, that's, the, that's the transitional part, okay? At, at the end of verse 34 into 35, it's no longer present, or for us, 2,000 years later, past tense. Starting in verse 36, everything starts moving forward into future. And he also stops being specific. You'll notice almost right away, he stops being specific to the point where he says, but of that day and hour, no one knows. All of a sudden, he goes from being Mr. Specific to, here's all the hints. You're not going to be able to miss this. You guys have to understand. When Rome invaded Jerusalem in A.D. 70, it was very specific. The Jews that had heard these words from Jesus on the Mount of Olives were like, oh my gosh, it's happening. Everything Jesus said was going to happen is happening right now. Thank God I'm not pregnant. That's what they're thinking. Okay? Because they're having to run. They, they snuck up on the Jews. The Jews had no idea they were coming. It was all of a sudden one day we're having a great time. And the next moment, the Romans are here. And they completely destroy the temple. And you guys have probably heard me tell this, but those of you that haven't, I'll tell you this. It says that... They burned the temple so completely that everything inside the temple either disintegrated or melted. You don't know how much gold was inside the temple? 
a lot of gold. Everything, all the utensils, all of the candlesticks, even the walls had gold on them. And they burned it so hot and burned it with so much fire that the gold all melted and went down into the foundation stones of the temple. So what did Jesus say at the beginning of Matthew 24? Let's turn on time. So when it was time, after this was all done, it says that Jews and Romans alike went down and dug up the very foundation stones of the temple to get the gold out. Not one stone would be left upon another. It's tremendously prophetic. So this all takes place, and it is not just a Roman invasion. It's not just a city being taken over. It's not just a building being destroyed. It is more than that. It is the end of a dispensation. It is no longer will you go to this building and practice religion in this way. No longer will you worship in three succinct areas inside a building. No, the worshipers that I'm coming to give you are worshipers that worship how? In spirit and in truth. You don't have to go to some mountain somewhere to worship. I am disintegrating this thing. This dispensation is going away. And I'm walking into this dispensation where it's I and me, me and you, and we will no longer worship in a building. Uh oh. Hello? Our worship really isn't about that band and us singing. Our worship is about being Him in the earth, 1 John 4, 17. So, i got to, I got to be disciplined here. <laughs> but of that day and hour, no one knows. So he's beginning to answer the third question, which is? Yeah. The end of the age, the end of the world. The end of what I would like to call this dispensation. This third one. Okay? For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. There will be two men in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be at the grinding mill. One will be taken, one will be left. Two quick things. I want to tell you, so much of the rest all the way into the end of 25 is two specific things Jesus is trying to do. Number one, he's trying to tell you that the end of the age will be a surprise to everybody. We will not know it. It will all of a sudden take place. Jesus even himself said, I don't even know. The Father alone knows. Second thing, very important. The two, one will be left, one will be taken. Okay, I'm going to do this really quick because some of you have already heard me teach on this multiple times. But you guys need to hear this. Okay? In the days of Noah, go with me, okay? When the flood came, sorry, when the rains came, who jumped into the boat? The righteous or the unrighteous? The righteous, right? The righteous jump into a boat because they know, they heard the promise, rain's coming. And I'm willing to bet that Noah was telling other people why he was building a boat, though they had never seen a boat before. What's rain? And what's rain? They've never seen rain before. So all of this is taking place. The rain comes, and they're just busy marrying and giving in marriage, partying, having a good old time. It starts raining, and all of a sudden, Moses, or Noah, <laughs> Moses, Noah says, let's go, kids, and all you stinky animals, we're getting in there, we're leaving. And he locks up the door, he leaves, the rain comes. Who is taken out of the earth? The unrighteous. The unrighteous. Who remains on the earth? The righteous. The righteous. Just as in the days of Noah, Noah so shall these days be. With me so far? Yep. Parable of the wheat and the tares. Anybody know that one? Yep. Okay. He sows his wheat. Beautiful. Gets it. Someone in the middle of the night comes and sows tares, right? So. Couple t uh, it takes a little while for them to grow up and all of a sudden realize, oh my gosh, sir, someone planted, an enemy specifically, planted wheats, weeds with our wheat. There's tares in our wheat. He says, no, nah, don't worry about it. We'll just wait and pull them all up because if you pull up the tares now, you'll also pull up the wheat. The wheat's not done being grown. So wait till the end. And at the end, 
will harvest both together. The wheat we will keep, and the tares we will... What's taken out of the earth and what remains? Righteous and the unrighteous. Guys, it is very clear. And the word here, and I, I wish I could say it correctly in the Greek, but the word to be taken is parlo. It's almost like an Italian word, parlo or, or something along those lines. And it's the idea of protecting something during a tribulation period. And then once a the tribulation period is over, it remains. Mm -hmm. Lord's going to come and he's going to make sure that Noah is safe while he's taking out all the evil. This end of the age is going to take place. You're not getting raptured out of here. You're not getting rescued before all of this stuff happens. You're actually going to be helped and protected and preserved so that you can do what this place was always created to be and do. Rule and reign here on this planet, you and me, me and you, here. Why would Adam and Eve come to earth? Why did he put us here? He's only going to take us out and we live in heaven forever. Come on. The summation, remember the word? The end of the age is the consummation of all things. I'm going to finish what I started, says the Lord. So this is what I'm going to do. I put Adam and Eve here. So what they could do, they could be fruitful, they could multiply, and they would fill the earth and subdue it. So I'm going to take everything out eventually. Once they become like me, then I'm going to take everything out of the way that hinders from them being able to do that very thing I promised to them. Oh, there's a rapture. Just not the one we're thinking. In fact, that hard word, harpezo, in 1 Thessalonians, talks about being raptured up with the Lord, being caught up. It's a sexual term, harpezo. It means to be in the height of ecstasy with Him. That's something that should be happening right now with us. Okay, so all of this is important for you to not... Oh, gosh, I'm, poor Harold's been ignored here. I want you to read... I, want, I, was, I wanted to read something here about the end of the age. This generation. Okay. So the third question that the disciples ask pertains to the end of the age, Matthew 24, 3. As we mentioned earlier, the Greek word age is aeon, is translated in some Bible versions as the world. I think I talked about this. And therefore, it may be understood that the disciples were asking about the end of the world. In the following discussion, we will use the term age, but the end of the age definitely will be the end of the world as we know it. Okay? So, when, when Jesus here, in verses 36... All the way through. Let's just keep going. Let's just look at some more here. Uh, Therefore, be on the alert, verse 42, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. It's constantly a reminder. This is going to be a surprise. You better be about the business of my Father. Okay? Chapter 25. The kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish. Five were prudent. When the foolish took their lamps, it took no oil. What are we supposed to be in this time? Always prepared. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout. Surprise! The bridegroom's here at midnight? What? What's that? Then all the virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the prudent or the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there's not going to be enough for us and you. Go to the dealer and buy some. And when they did, by the time they got back, they had already gone in. The party had already started. They missed it. It's a picture. Be ready. Always be about his business. Always be about the kingdom. This coming of the end of the world is going to be a surprise. But the coming of Jesus has already what? Happened. All right. I promised my wife I'd be done by eight. Oh, there's so many places I'd rather... Oh, I want to keep going. Oh, uh, Aaron, you asked about the heaven and earth will pass away. Mm -hmm. This is something Harold says here. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Jesus is emphasizing how his words certainly will come true, 
But he's also making a statement about the end of things, heaven and earth passing away. That is what the disciples asked in their third question. What about the end of the world? <coughs> and finally, we can know that this, this is where Jesus began answering the third question. He starts about talking about the day and the hour. And that's when Peter, if you look at 2 Peter, last verse, promise. I know it's been heavy. Know this, first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? That was happening in that time. And saying, Where is the... All right. For since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning. Jump down to verse 7. But by His word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Do not let this one fast fact escape your notice. Behold, with the day with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient. Verse 10, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. There it is again. Reminder, it's, gonna, it's just going to happen. In which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Okay? I don't, the way that looks to me, I just want you to, this is where I kind of go off into my opinion, okay? If you look at Genesis 1, and those of you that have been with me for a little while know this, that I don't believe Genesis 1 is the beginning. I believe Genesis 1 is an end and a beginning. If you look at it, it's as if something has just taken place and God is ready to start over. You look at it, the word waters, Ashley's heard this more times than she wishes to know. I feel bad for her because she gets to hear the word piss water again. But the word in the Hebrew for waters means waste water. Actually, the water that goes down the sewer. Okay? So when the Spirit is hovering over the surface of the waters, He's hovering over waste. Genesis 1. I'm not trying to get a little sci-fi on you, but I'm just telling you what the Hebrew word is there. Which gives the indication that something had just happened that was resulting in ruin. And God's like, okay. You ready, boys? We're starting over. Okay? That's what I think happens here in 2 Peter. Same kind of thing. I think the earth is here, but we start over. You know what? He doesn't just do this in Genesis and then here in 2 Peter. Where else does he do that in Scripture? Where else does he destroy it all and starts over? Noah. 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 We just talked about it. He's not afraid to scrap his work and start over. He's not afraid to do that. And that's what's going to happen here. But he's not going to have it just be Noah and his kids anymore. Not this time. This end of the age is going to be from rulership. It's going to be from a people, not just, I'm on a boat, and I'm just going to float here until it all ends. No, not this time. This time, I'm going to cause the people to rule and reign. And whatever you build, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, you better be careful because there's a fire coming. You guys know this. And all of your work, Devin, is going to be tested by this fire. This fire. This 2 Peter 3 fire. Everything you build. Okay, if it doesn't happen in my generation, it's going to happen in some future generation of mine. And it's going to be a part of what I've built. Why do you think I put so much time into kids? That's right. Why do you think I give so much of my life to them? Because they might be the ones. They're going to be my work. And whatever they build is going to be, have my DNA in it. And I want to make sure when the fire comes and this girl's been building, that I want to make sure that what she's built lasts. Because this is what Paul says. Paul says, you know what? Most, or many men's works are not going to last the fire. I'll preserve the man. Back to that preserving. One will be left. One will be taken. But I'm burning all this stuff up. Be careful how you build. This whole surprise thing is about Melody. You can't just do whatever the H you want with your life. This is serious stuff. You need to lay hold of what God laid hold of you for. Because this could happen at any moment. I'm not just waiting for a certain time. I, here's what I think. The reason why it's a surprise, the reason why Jesus doesn't know, is it's just like in Genesis 9. That's it! I'm done! 
I'm done. That's why all this, please, if anyone ever comes on your TV and starts talking about signs of the end, turn off the TV. Amen. <laughs> turn it off. They do not know what they're talking about. Because only the Father knows. And I'm telling you, it's going to be just like in Genesis 9. I will not strive with flesh any longer. I'm done. Let's do this. My ruler and reigners, let's do this. My kids, my sons, my daughters, my kings, king of kings, get over here and lead your people in triumphant victory. It is time to start over. And that's what it's going to be. And right now, in this place, in the heavenly place, He is ruling and reigning through us. Why? Because He wants as many of His kids as possible as part of this generation. This is a dispensation. This is a generation. He wants this as full. Remember how we talked about He is not going to bring His beautiful, mature head and put it on an emaciated body. That's not what He wants. He wants Schwarzenegger in his prime, so to speak. He wants a mature son that belongs to the full stature and measure of Christ. I want to be... And then when he comes, he's like, ah, burn it all. Let's start fresh. Let's do this right. And then I think it's going to last the rest of our eternity like that. No more is he going to let evil reign. That's what Revelation says. If we go digging into Revelation, I can promise you, there's going to come a day where evil ends. And holiness and righteousness will last for eternity. Not in some far off place. No, no, no. He created this, this place called earth in this particular dimension, this far away from the sun, this far away from the other galaxies for a purpose. He wants life everlasting here. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on terra firma as it is in heaven. This is the end goal, not that. Amen? That's why this is a victorious gospel. That's why it's not about, oh my God, we better get out of here before all hell breaks loose. No. We stay so that all of heaven breaks loose. That's right. Yeah, they call it the good news and then everybody's burned away. Yeah. How's that good news? <laughs> of the increase of his government, there will be no end. Quit worrying about it. Rise up. Any questions? Will you be bringing back a particular song called Upside Down in the near future? <laughs> I just thought. <laughs> Love you, Mark. I doubt it, because then I'd have to bring back a cartwheel. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, please. No, you don't know this. When we first got in here, I would do cartwheels on that stage. That was also at the middle school. Now I'd be afraid I'd break something. <laughs> Internally. <laughs> so any questions? Are you, so there's really, everybody just gets this? Does it make sense to you? No, honestly. Yes. yes. Do I get it? No. Do your kids know yes. anything other than that? Do they? My kids? Yeah. No. In fact, Lauren, if you want to talk about this, you can. But she has friends at school who she loves dearly, at least when she was in high school. But it was hard to hang around them. When you start talking about... Yeah. I, I even told them, I was like, are you sure? <laughs> yeah. But I don't think it's an argument that you get into. No, I don't. You know? I do not believe right. this is just my opinion. I don't think we should have to prove it no. yeah. at all. That's right. Just so you guys have an idea, the overall view that I'm presenting to you is called partial preterist. Just to give you an understanding of what we believe here. Preterist. P R E. T E R I S T. Harold has it in the book. Yeah. <laughs> Which means that, okay, a futurist view means that everything, like I just read to you, Matthew 24 and in Revelation, is all in the future. A preterist view means that everything in Scripture is currently happening now. Present tense. So, not now, I should say, but when it was written. The present of when it was written. I should be holding a Bible here, but you know what I mean. Partial preterist means that, for example, let's just use the book of Revelation. A certain amount of Revelation is for that moment in time when it was written, and then the rest of Revelation is about a future of the 
church. I believe in a partial preterist view of scripture. So for example, in Matthew 24, two thirds of their questions were what? For that generation. And then suddenly in verse 36, even look at the, the tenses of the verbs change to what? Future. Even look at it. It's incredible. And he immediately changes from Mr. Specific, specificity to, oh, no. Just whatever you do, be ready. Okay? Partial preterist. It's going to happen. It already happened or is about to happen. It's a difference. So if anybody ever asks you, what in the heck kind of view is that? And by the way, you would be surprised how much of current day Christianity believes this. Spurgeon believed this. So many of the original fathers of the faith believed what I've just taught you. It wasn't until the mid-1800s that this whole idea of a rapture suddenly, boo! Yeah. Some girl had a dream. Go read it. Yeah. And it all came out of that. I can promise you the majority of Christianity believes what I just taught you. We're getting back to that. No more Western theology. It's time for Christ theology. Jesus theology. All right, seriously, I'm done. Stop it.